Imagine you're a freshman in college majoring in music education, studying music theory, and practicing for your percussion jury exam as well as your damn music history final. Then, out of nowhere, your history TA mentions a new class starting next semester, the culture of music and video games, or something like that. I don't remember the name, it was a semester ago. I was floored when I heard about this class. It's literally the culmination of the two things that keep me sane on the daily, and I was never more excited for winter break to end. The curriculum started with the origins of sound technology and early game systems like the Atari and such, and at the end we started learning more about music technology like studio setups and stuff like that. However, along the way, we discussed different composers in gaming and how companies started utilizing composers to begin with. There's a lot to talk about with that subject, but that's for another video potentially. The genius behind Nintendo soundtracks overall is Koji Kondo. Now, most of you already know this, but for those who don't, he's the guy that composed this, and this. He's honestly one of my favorite video game composers of all time, and trust me, I know a few. The topic of that day was Ocarina of Time and how the teleportation songs relate to real-world song styles. Before that class began, I had actually been thinking about the different styles in my own time, playing through the game as a student that enjoys music, but I never noticed the details until recently. And as a kid, I just thought they were weird pronunciations of actual words. I always thought Minuet was a typo of Minute, and I thought Serenade was a type of Gatorade. Looking back at it, I don't get why I thought Gatorade of Water made sense. Uh, uh, yeah. Jeez, Kondo, making us learn big boy words from your song titles since 1998? You little devil. Anyways, now that I'm a grown, sophisticated, independent, not that grown, very dependent, almost sophomore in college for music, I finally understand all the song styles and what makes them unique. So without further ado, let's jump right in with... Before we get into the minuet of Forest itself, let's first define what a minuet actually is. It's a slow two-person dance in triple time. It's also similar to a waltz in that it's in triple time with emphasis on the first beat while the second and third beats are noticeably weaker in having staccato. The differences between the two, however, lie more in the dance and physical aspects of each style rather than the musical, so we won't be covering that today. However, I encourage you to look into it yourself. Wow, that was short and sweet, wasn't it? Well, don't worry though, the other sections will be way longer than that one. Most of them, at least. For this part of the video, I'll play the actual song from the game with a piano transcription on the screen for you to see. I couldn't find any full scores online, and I don't have the patience to make one myself, so I'll credit the creators of the transcriptions at the end of the video. The Minuet of Forest easily utilizes the triple time with the underlying strings, as well as having the staccato second and third beats. This isn't a must-have for every minuet or waltz, but it certainly adds to the feel. Now we arrive at my favorite of the song styles, the Bolero of Fire. A bolero is a slow dance with Spanish and Cuban varieties, both of which are very different in terms of style. In regard to the Bolero of Fire, it takes more from the Spanish variety, so for the purpose of this video, that's the one we'll focus on. Spanish boleros are in triple time and are a combination of the contradanza and the sevillana, which are Spanish folkloric dances. The most famous of boleros in the real world is Maurice Ravel's Bolero, which was premiered in 1928. Also, as a little side fact, Kochi Kondo was actually going to use Ravel's Bolero as the main Zelda theme for the first Zelda way back on the NES. But due to the deadlines and copyright expirations, he had to crunch down and compose a brand new theme in one damn night. Now that's an awesome man. Apparently Kondo really loves Ravel because the entirety of the Bolero of Fire seems to be a reference to Ravel's most famous work. The background snare drum rhythm is the exact same as Ravel's piece, and the pizzicato strings in the bass line are similar as well. The only differentiating factor is the melody. The Bolero of Fire's melody is constant 16th notes, while Ravel's piece mixes it up with 16th notes and 8th notes, and is more legato.
I don't have a clever intro for this section, so let's just get into it. Gatorades serenades vary depending on the musical era, however the most recognizable version is from the classical slash romantic era. The dictionary.com definition states it as a complimentary performance of vocal or instrumental music in the open air at night, as by a lover under the window of his lady. You know when a guy is serenading a lady for her affection and she's like, ew, and, he, and then walks away and he just follows her anyways? It's like that. This sort of fits the theme of the Water Temple arc of Ocarina of Time. Since you're trying to find out what happened to Princess Ruto, who has feelings for Link, and has had them for seven years, it fits the whole romance theme and is the most romantic out of all the arcs in the game, so it makes sense that they would choose the serenade style. The Serenade of Water utilizes contrasting motion in its music. The main melody is ascending while the harmony descends. This, in my opinion, depicts the individualization of the two bodies, in this case, Link and Ruto, both having different mindsets on their relationship with each other. I might be thinking too much into this, but that's the point of the video, isn't it? Anyways, take a listen. Alright, listen, I know what you're thinking. Caden, doesn't Nocturne mean night or of the night? Doesn't the Shadow Temple reflect the nocturnal aspect of the song? And to that, I say... Why are you asking questions? Do you think your opinion matters? Do you think this is a democracy? Anyways, yes, everything you thought you had the right to ask is correct, and it is pretty cut and dry. But I'm here to do one thing, and that's to analyze these songs, damn it, so that's what I'm gonna do. Nocturnes are evocative of the night, like Batman, so they have to be really moody while at the same time being extremely edgy. <laughs> Alright, but seriously, I couldn't find much more information on Nocturnes other than that they are usually single movement pieces written for solo piano. However, there might be some things we can put together by comparing qualities from other Nocturnes in history. And by others, I mean one. Chopin's Nocturne in C sharp minor is personally one of my favorite Nocturnes, although I might be biased because my friend performed it. The piece has, as you can tell by the name, a minor key, meaning it generally won't sound pleasant. If a musical work has minor in the title, it's safe to assume it's not going to sound entirely pleasant. There are also points at the end of the phrases that don't resolve, which adds to the whole dark and edgy role of the Nocturne. Translating that over to the Nocturne of Shadow, both of the qualities we listed for Chopin's Nocturne can easily fit in with it. The Nocturne of Shadow is in a minor key, as well as having numerous unresolved phrases. The music keeps you on the edge of your seat and makes you feel uncomfortable and uneasy. Almost like someone is watching you. Meh, it's been a long night. Probably just my imagination. Anyways, take a listen. You thought we were out of the edgy woods for a second there, didn't you? But we still got one more dark one. Requiems, or Requiem Masses, are celebrations and remembrances of the souls of the dead. And it's because of this that the Requiem of Spirit, in my opinion, is darker than the Nocturne of Shadow. Where the Nocturne of Shadow and Shadow Temple are dark in a more torture chamber kind of way, the Requiem of Spirit and Spirit Temple are dark in a similar way to that of an ancient tomb of the Pharaoh. Since the spirit temple seems to be based on a type of tomb, or at least a shrine dedicated to a deity, this seems to be the reason behind choosing the Requiem style for this religion. You know, since dead people and god. The magic of the Requiem of Spirit comes from the melody and the underlying counter melody. They both work together in a way that starts really dissonant, but eventually ends up kind of pleasant. As if the souls of the dead have finally reached eternal peace with their one true creator. That was kind of cheesy, even for me. But I digress. Take a listen.
I feel like this one's pretty self-explanatory, similar to the Nocturne, and there really isn't much to talk about, however there are some points I'd like to cover. The pre in prelude implies that this takes place before the rest of the song or piece. The dictionary definition describes it as an introductory piece of music, most commonly an orchestral opening to an act of an opera, the first movement of a suite, or a piece preceding a fugue. Think of it as the basket of butter rolls that comes right before that full rack of baby back ribs. Mm -mm. In short, it's the intro that leads into the rest of the piece, basically. To start off, the melody resolves up and maintains a major key. In the ending of the song, the string section ends with an unresolved note, implying that the resolution will occur later, because it's a prelude. And finally, the ascending harp adds a nice pleasant cherry on top. The Prelude of Light is a very happy song compared to the others we've talked about. In short, everything about this song is pleasant except for the one unresolved note that keeps the ending more open. Take a listen. And that about does it for this video. Shoutouts to Ji Han, the Deku Trombonist, and Piano Man for the piano transcriptions. You can find these fellows and many more at www.ninsheetmusic.org, where there are tons of sheet music selections from every Zelda game and basically every Nintendo game ever. Also, shoutouts to Miss Evans for the one lesson in class where we discussed this topic, and I got the idea to make this video. And shout out to you for watching this video, honestly. It really means a lot to me. I know everyone says that, but for real. I'm not a major creator on YouTube, so whenever a video gets more than 100 views, I die of happiness. So again, thank you so much. And also, welcome to all the new subscribers. My Super Smash Bros. Ultimate prediction video uh, that I uploaded about a month ago sort of blew up, and I gained a hefty amount of uh, subscribers from that. So I just wanted to say, welcome to all. Now that I have a better idea of how hard it is to script for heavy edited videos like this to this scale, you can expect more videos like this, I already have a few coming down the pike, as well as a sequel to this video where I talk about Majora's Mask Ocarina songs. So if you want to keep up with these videos, uh, make sure you subscribe and click the bell icon to make sure you don't miss out. If you have any questions uh, about anything I've talked about today, please feel free to ask me in the comments or on Twitter at KadenTheDog, and I'll hit you up. Again, thank you so much for watching this video, and take it easy. Peace out. K-Dog out.